All right, so today we're going to look at the urban models um, and just how uh, cities organize themselves um, and the differences that they have um, in the U.S. and urban models. All right, so your learning goal is students will be able to explain where people are distributed in urban areas in North America. Um, to be at a three, which is right on target, you can discuss the various urban models of North America. You can tell me about the different models, some of the different aspects of them. And four, um, you can do all of three, plus you can explain why these patterns exist based on historical and sociological changes, what happened and how they're different. All right, so the very first thing we need to talk about is, um, I want to look at is uh, John Borchardt's um, epics. And these are urban stages of evolution of American metropolis. When he looked at um, what, um, how did the American city change based on transportation and communication. So the first, um, you see it right here, um, the sail wagon epic um, associated with low, t um, low technology. It was uh, sailboats, wagons, um, those types of things. And then um, the invention of the steam engine um, and the locomotive led to the iron horse epic which was steam-powered, uh, rail railroads, um, all of those things led to this newfound um, transportation. And then the 1870s to the 1920s, that is the full impact of the Industrial Revolution. Um, everything begins to expand. The hinterlands begin to expand. Um, the population grows, and the steel rail epoch um, is very massive. You have the Transcontinental Railroad that is finished. People can move at a quicker pace. The, the trains become faster, um, and people begin to move um, on them. And then the fourth um, one from 1920 to 1970, um, this is where the uh, invention of the automobile, the airplane, um, on all of that, how it changed um, the city um, as it goes. So that first one, you had the cities close to waterways. The second ones, they could begin to expand a little bit more, um, but they still had to be close um, to the waterway because you had... Um, and, and smaller. Uh, the third one, it began to stretch out and the cities to become bigger and towns set up along the railroad junctions were uh, to set up to help to meet uh, the needs of the people on the trains. And then the last one, cities could spread um, throughout wherever they were because of the car and the airplane. Uh, the last one, which was after Borchert um, developed his four epics, um, is the high technology epic. And so now this is um, the expansion of services, information industries, which now has led to booming um, cities that they don't have to rely on um, a specific trade or specific thing for it. All right, so we have four urban models we're going to look at. They are the concentric zone model, the sector model, the multiple nuclei model, and the galactic urban or galactic city model, um, also known as the peripheral model. So right now what you need to do is to take a sheet of paper, you need to create a foldable where you fold it in half and then fold it in fourths and take notes about each model um, on there. So on the front of the foldable, you're going to write the model name and um, the uh, picture of the model. And all of these pictures can be found in your textbook. Um, you can trace them right out of the textbook if you want. Um, so the top one's the concentric zone, then the sector, then the multiple nuclei, and then the galactic city is the last. Okay, so the concentric zone model. Let's talk what it is. It was developed by Ernst Burgess. So all of this needs to be in the inside of your foldable. So all of this needs to be in the inside of your foldable. And I'll be checking your foldable. Um, the geographer is Ernst Burgess. Um, so what Ernst Burgess said um, is that as a city grows outward, it grows in a set of rings. And the rings are different classes of people. Um, so you have the CBD, which is the downtown business district. And then out from there, you have these rings that develop. And the people living in those rings have a unique characteristic that's common to everyone living within those rings. So he says the second is where you're going to have your um, industry and your poor houses. Um, the third is where you're going to find your working class, your modest homes, working class families. They're not too far away from the CBD and the industry, which is where they need to get to to work. Um, the fourth, it's going to be your income is going to grow more and your middle class are going to live there. They're going to have bigger, newer homes. They're still middle class, so they're not uh, very wealthy, but they aren't 
um, reliant on the low in class, low income um, housing that's available in your second and third um, level. These may be more of your uh, service-based industry workers who aren't working in the factories. They may be commuting to um, the CBD to work in the businesses there. And then last one, the fifth one is the commuter zone. And this is um, the wealthiest of regions um, on it. So as you move away from the CBD, um, you see the wealthier people uh, living out here. So down here, most important feature, there's a positive correlation with socioeconomic status of the households and distance from the CBD. So if you notice, as you get away from the CBD, the wealth increases. So we know the wealth increases as you get further away from the CBD. More fluent houses were observed to live at greater distances from the central city. It's important to note that this was developed in the 1920s. Um, using Chicago as his example um, for it. So here's the picture that's in your textbook, um, and you can see um, just how it would go. So you have the CBD downtown, and then you have these uh, zone of transition, the industry industrial park, um, lower class residents, and then your workers. These are the working zones. So you see more apartments, tenement style houses, um, multi-family houses. Uh, multifamily residences and then you move to the uh, next ring which is the b better residences middle class residences so you see uh, some a lot more single family housing and actually you see single family housing and you don't see the industry located there and then you look on the outskirts um, and you see um, out here um, in the last ring the fifth ring the single the bigger houses um, to support um, the wealthier people Remember our bid rent curve that applies to this. Why can the wealthy people move further away from the cities? Because the land is cheaper there. So as you move away from the city, it's cheaper land so they can build bigger houses. So bid rent um, comes into play here as well. Our next one is the sector model. So in the next part of your foldable, you need to write the sector model. Okay, on the sector model, you need to include all of this um, information. You need to talk about the geographer, which is Homer Hoyt. Um, Homer Hoyt, he used his definition is that the city develops in a series of sectors, not rings. Okay, so that's a big deal, sectors and not rings. Um, activities expand outward from a wedge, from the center. Many of them are attracted for various activities. Um, and so the social classes are found in these wedges um, not in rings. So a big deal with all of these would be transportation. Transportation is the number one key. If you see right now the most important feature, major transportation routes were considered when constructing this model. So yet again, this city that it was based off of was Chicago as well. All right, so um, what it says is, is that here's the CBD and that let's just say zone five. You had wealthy people who lived, get mine. You had wealthy people who lived right here along the edge of the CBD. And so then more wealthy people moved in here and then wealthy people moved in here and they continued to grow outward um, because these people aren't going to move the wealthy people right here at the edge. They're going to continue to move outward um, with the wealth as it has. So that's how it all works with the, it, they move along transportation routes and they go from closest to the CBD and they move out. So the, it's not that the wealthy people move from right here like they do in the concentric zone model. They move, they, the wealthy people just continue to add on to the neighborhoods that they have. Transportation routes, right here you see two. This would be along a major highway or railroad um, station. Um, three is going to be your low class residence. And that they have in four is going to be the filled in of your middle class residence. Now, the wedges do not have to look exactly like this. They will not necessarily be in this order. But if you look at a city that follows the sector model, you're going to see where um, there are distinct wedges um, of social groups um, in there. So for instance, if this were to be Orlando, right here, this two, this zone of transportation and industry, that wedge, that would be right along I-4, 
and along I-4, and the railroad tracks are right there together. Um, so that'd be the transportation and industry zone. If you go just outside of, um, uh, just uh, west of the 408 um, area and I-4 interchange, you're going to see that's kind of an industrial park um, area right along the railroad tracks and I-4, and that would be here. Now you have your low-class residencies right along the side of that with um, the areas of Paramore um, and certain areas down there by the um, Amway Center, the Citrus Bowl, those areas which tend to be our lower class residential areas. Um, and so you're going to see those right along the side. And then the wealthy areas coming, um, extending out um, into Winter Park and those areas wedging out from the center of the city. So Orlando, you can see how it would fit into this and then all the other areas um, pockets through for it. Now, it's not saying there's only one wedge of wealthy. There can be another wedge of wealthy um, individuals over here as well, like in the, the Windermere area, um, where they tend to have more high-class residential areas as well. So, but the CBD is still essential to a sector model and to a concentric zone model. Those are the two big, that is, there's still of huge significance in both those models. Here's a picture in your book for you to um, also look at and to trace on the front of your foldable. The third model we're going to look at is the multiple nuclei model. The multiple nuclei model um, right here, Chair, uh, Chauncey Harris and Howard Ullman designed this city uh, model. Um, it's complex. The big thing that you need to pull from this is that there is more than one node of importance in this model. You do have the CBD which is still has a significance and an importance, but you also have other um, nodes that attract to it. So you would have the high class, um, you know, a heavy industry zone. So an industrial park, which will have things around it. You're gonna have a, a outlying business district of a residential area um, right around there that's gonna kind of hub to that. You're going to have, you know, maybe colleges and universities are going to be another hub for uh, people to, to different types of businesses to agglomerate um, around that would meet the needs of the students and the people at the college level. So you're going to have different nodes or importance, like it says there, uh, ports, neighborhood, business centers, university, airport, parks, um, attractions like the Disney, um, Universal, SeaWorld, area, the attractions area of Orlando would be another example of a node around the airport. Um, so you have different businesses that agglomerate there and people agglomerate around there for a different uh, function. So they're not all, the multiple nuclear model is not centered on the central business district as the other two are. This is a different style. The CBD is still there, but you have other nodes of importance throughout the urban landscape. So here's the picture that you have. And so you see in this model, you have the CBD here, but you have other nodes that may attract people of different, um, different means to those areas. So the college is gonna have people, a university is gonna have people who work at the university or studying in the university. Um, the new uh, VA hospital, New Moore's Hospital Research Parkway, all that it's gonna attract a different type of person that'll live there as opposed to, um, you know, the people living by UCF or the people living at the attractions. Okay, so what are some of the critiques of the model? This needs to go on the back of your foldable, some of the critiques of the model. Okay, these were developed to generalize about the patterns of urban land use found in industrial cities. So they're very general about the patterns. And general models devised to understand the overall patterns of land use. They were specifically used by, especially the first two, Chicago, to show um, how this worked. So they're very general and they're not going to apply, per, a per, they're not going to apply perfectly to every single model uh, city in the United States. They also find that the models are static. They're, they don't leave for a lot of change. Um, there could be a lot of, um, with deindustrialization, has led to a lot of change in urban settlements throughout the country. Um, land use in a generic city. Like I said, it used Chicago as its model, but it created this generic city. Um, land use may change, which is a big issue. Um, and they may be useful 
and the way in which land is devoted in different uses within the city. So it shows us that there's still this generalization, this general area that you have. There's still a CBD. You still have a zone of uh, industry. You still have all that. So they still have this general use of land um, within um, the cities. None of them can accurately describe patterns of land use in all cities, and all the models have been criticized for being more applicable to the U.S. Um, than to cities in other countries. So they're very um, American-centric, but that they are models of North America, so it's hard to apply them um, in this area without um, in other areas of the world. The last one is the galactic urban model or the galactic city model or sometimes known as the peripheral model. Okay, this was the galactic city was uh, developed by Chauncey Harris. You may recognize him from the um, multiple nuclei model. And it is an urban area that consists of an inner city surrounded by a large suburban residential and business um, area tied together by a beltway or ring road. Edge cities are the big parts of this. They're on the outskirts. So you have the big area in the middle, and then you have a ring around it, and that's where your your big edge cities um, set up along the periphery, hence the peripheral model, the periphery of this big city. It's seen as the galactic city, where they call it, because that big, that main city in the middle is kind of like the sun, and it attracts everything to it, like a gravity would um, into um, the sun. All the planets and everything are attracted to the sun and its gra uh, gravitational pull. Um, so just like that, there's this big city and all of these other areas are pulled to it. Um, it does lead to urban sprawl and to segregation that characterize many suburbs. Here's a picture of the peripheral model or the galactic city or galactic urban model. Uh, a big, a great example of this is Atlanta, Georgia, where you have Atlanta as the heart of the city, and then you have all these edge cities along the outskirts of it that they're still attracted to Atlanta. Atlanta still has the major pool of it, but um, these, they're functioning cities. They don't necessarily have um, that connection and tie to um, the big city completely, but it still has enough draw to them but they're set up along this ring around the outside of Atlanta, which then connects it to Atlanta itself. So those are the four urban models that we're going to talk about, the concentric zone, uh, sector model, multiple nuclei, and galactic city. Please uh, rewatch the video if you need to, to how to fold in your foldable. Picture on the front, description and um, main importance on the back and then on the middle and side and on the back is going to be the critiques of the model and I will see you in class tomorrow.